you can take a 12 volt car alternator, connect it up with a small gasoline engine and recharge a 12 volt battery bank. And that works. But what if we want to recharge something else? I have a 48 volt battery bank. So is it possible that I could remove the voltage regulator from this, have a higher voltage run into a charge controller and then recharge a 48 volt battery bank? I don't know. I've never seen it done before. I've never tried it. We're going to try it together in this video. Here we go. Hi everyone, I'm David and I'm on a mission to take my house and garage off grid. I'm going to talk for the next few minutes about the theory of operation, which might get a little bit boring. So if you want to just skip to the build, go ahead and skip forward at this point. This is a car alternator. I picked this one up for a hundred bucks on Craigslist. Oftentimes car alternators have voltage regulators built in. So they're always putting out that 14.4 volts or so, which is really nice for recharging a 12 volt battery. And that works great for a car. And if you have a 12 volt system, you can use that right out of the box. In my case, I have a 48 volt battery bank. I'm going to try removing the voltage regulator so that I can try running this up at a higher voltage. I don't know if it's gonna work, but if we can get it to say roughly 80 volts out of this alternator, then I can send it into something like this, a solar charge controller. Yes, I happen to be using a Victron one that I've had from previous projects, but uh, many voltage regulators can work for this job. It doesn't have to be blue. <laughs> I'm going to quickly run down my theory of operation, but please forgive me if I screw something up because I'm not an electrical engineer. So if you have this in a car, it's connected to your 12 volt battery bank. The aluminum casing of this is grounded to the negative side of the 12 volt battery. Inside is a voltage regulator, which I think is nothing more than a pulse width modulator. So it is sending out pulses of 12 volts to the uh, field winding, which is the rotor. The rotor is the part that turns, it rotates. It's the electromagnet. Depending on the duration of those pulses, we're going to have a larger or smaller magnetic flux. Depending on how large or small that is, we're inducing more or less voltage on the stator or the stationary windings, which are around the outside. So if you're revving this alternator really high because you're accelerating, the pulses are gonna be very small so that the output of this continues to be 14.4 volts. But if you are sitting there at idle and the RPM is very low, the revolutions per minute are very low, then the duration of the pulses will be longer in duration, so it continues putting out 14.4 volts. Now, if a car typically idles at 800 RPM, and uh, if this is, say, a two to one ratio between the crankshaft and the pulley on the alternator, then we're talking 1600 RPM. So if 1600 RPM is the smallest uh, RPM that this would ever see, then that might be, uh, the pulses might be continuously on at that point. Uh, and so I know that I need to rev this up higher than that. This gasoline engine is a Predator from Harbor Freight. This is self-governed to 3600 RPM mechanically. And a lot of the small engines are. Now, potentially, I might be able to get 80 volts out of this alternator if I spin it at 3600 RPM, but I don't know. If I can, that means I could direct couple this to the output shaft of the engine. Now, that would be great because it eliminates the belt, but I don't know if 3600 RPM is going to be a high enough RPM. When I was looking up the RPMs for alternators, I was finding that some of them can rev all the way up to 1200 RPM. So I'm going to hook this up with a pulley so that I can spin this higher. Uh, so I'll try spinning it up at seven or 8,000 RPM, and that should ensure that I get over 80 volts. I, I hope it does, but I will check with a tachometer later uh, when we're actually running and see at what uh, RPM I need in order to actually get that 80 volts out. And it should be noted that I'm gonna put a constant 12 volts to the rotor, to the electromagnet, uh, for the purposes of this test. Okay. <laughs> If any of that was confusing, don't worry, we will dive into it a lot more uh, in the video to come. With all that out of the way, let's talk about the parts we're gonna use. Well, this engine is the 224cc engine from Harbor Freight. This one typically retails for $200. 
Uh, I was going to purchase the 212cc, slightly smaller than this, uh, but this one was on sale for $170 when I walked into Harbor Freight, and the 212cc was standard price of $160. So this was $10 more, and you get more torque and slightly more horsepower, but the torque curve is earlier. So anyways, I picked this one up instead. I think it's gonna work well for our project. Now the alternator. I jumped on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist and I searched for alternators and there were dozens available within just 40 miles from my location. So there's tons of alternators out there. I wanted one that looked pretty decent. So I bought this for $100, typically sells for $350 and I think it's rated for 220 amps. Uh, so this has a, a serpentine belt style pulley on it. It's an eight groove pulley. Uh, but I had already purchased some parts for a different alternator that had a six groove. So I'm gonna be using a six groove pulley on the uh, engine and a six groove belt to drive this. And over here we have a solar charge controller. This is an MPPT or maximum power point uh, tracker. Uh, this is a Victron model. It doesn't have to be blue. Uh, you could purchase a different uh, brand, uh, but I don't know what the maximum voltage that this will come out at this charge controller can take up to 250 volts coming in. So that should be high enough for whatever voltage we get out of this. But once we actually rev it up, I'll be able to measure the open circuit voltage and make sure before connecting the solar charge controller. Because if this puts out say 300 volts DC, then I can't use this charge controller with it. I don't think we'll get that high, but just in theory. <laughs> I took this to my local auto parts store. They chucked it into a machine, tested it, and it passed. So I know it is a working alternator. So that is the basic parts that we'll be using. Now let's get into the alternator, take it apart, and try to get it ready for this build. It's a AutoZone Duralast, which, uh, you know, it's a rebuilt alternator. And this has a slightly different style stator. Uh, that I've heard sometimes nicknamed six phase, even though that's not exactly accurate. Here we go. Uh, one, two, three, four, and five, six wires coming up from the stator. So I believe the way that this is designed, it's a uh, three phase in Y configuration, but there are two windings, uh, which wind up being in parallel. Positive post here coming off of the positive heat sink. So in this case, we have three pins. We've got the voltage regulator built into this box, and then our brushes. You can see the plastic bushings here. They're trying to insulate the positive plate of the rectifier from the aluminum housing because the aluminum housing is negative. The negative of the rectifier is connected directly to the aluminum housing. And over here, we can actually see a couple of these stator windings coming up. So you can see that stator winding uh, inside here. Okay, let's see if we can take off the voltage regulator. Okay, so here's our brush assembly. We have two brushes in there and then they're soldered outside. The voltage regulator is crimped on right here. It might also be soldered, but let's just cut that off. Go. So there's our voltage regulator removed. I'm not sure if that's a normal solder joint. That might actually be brazed. To me, it looks like the brazed point is just the very tip. So I'm gonna try grinding off just the top eighth of an inch and then that might release it. So I might be able to pry that open now. And all of these are ground away. So hopefully they'll release when I try to pull the bridge rectifier up and off. So this is the positive plate going to the positive terminal, but underneath it is the negative plate that the diodes are connected to. Something I'll point out right now is that this brush holder uh, has two spots where it's screwed down. One spot is to the aluminum housing, so we're gonna be able to keep that. The other spot 
was on the voltage regulator, which is right here, but we're removing the voltage regulator. So we're gonna lose that. Uh, so I don't know what I'll do there. Uh, potentially I could JB weld or something along those lines, but we'll see how secure it is uh, and then cross that bridge when we get to it. Those popped off, did you see that? See that? There, <laughs> nice, there we go. <laughs> there we are. So all of them broke free and we were able to pull this uh, bridge rectifier off. So each one of these circles is a diode. And you, as you can see, we have a lot of diodes here. They're embedded into the aluminum plates as a heat sink. The top aluminum plate turns into the conductive path for the positive post. The negative is the bottom one. Since we have uh, six wires coming up, we should have 12 of the diodes. Each wire is gonna need two diodes. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. And are there any on the back side? <laughs> That'll probably be enough. The plastic also indexed into the aluminum housing. I think I'm okay with that. Uh, this is a three phase stator, but there's two sets of windings in parallel. They don't get paralleled until the bridge rectifier. Uh, so I have to establish which wires are going to which uh, phase. Okay. So we've got a clamp on there. So that's part of the same phase. That's part of the same phase. So we have three wires that are all connected to the same phase. Uh, so this is an external bridge rectifier similar to this one. It's just this one is two bridge rectifiers that are joined in parallel on the DC side. Now this is the housing for the brushes. This is the positive side and this is the negative side. Now the negative side is going to go to this post uh, down here, which is negative to the entire case. But the positive side is going to be free floating. So I need to use a new attachment because I'm not going to use this voltage regulator anymore. So I need to do something else. So out of my parts bin here, I pulled a couple of little pieces. I'm putting these things together uh, facing up because I don't want it to go down and short to the housing. And to make sure that stays in place and doesn't uh, fall down and short, I'm gonna add a little bit of Loctite. And I'll put a little Kapton tape on here. Now in order to get this in place, we have to hold those brushes down. So there's a little hole right here. And I'm going to stick my finger in to press the brushes down against their spring. And as you can see, the, br the brushes are now pressed down. Go, pull that off. There we go. So now we've got our positive side and our negative side. Negative to the case and the positive side is floating there. 12 volt battery connected to the inner field coil. As you can see, it's sucking that in. <laughs> It's making an electromagnet, which is going to generate the flux that we need.
We have the crimps done on the end of each wire. As you can see, all the ones on the pink phase I ran with red, and all the ones that I marked out in yellow I ran in black wires. I wanted to make a base for this build, so I took two scrap pieces of plywood, these are half inch thick, and I cut them down to 20 inches by 24 inches, and then I spread some wood glue on them and glued them together. You can see I'm using several screws here, and I'll let this dry overnight. I'm setting up the circular saw to trim the edges of the base so that they are nice and flush. Now the town did lose grid power during this snowstorm, but since I operate most of the time off grid, I didn't have a problem. In fact, I'm running both the shop vac and the circular saw off the same phase of my Schneider inverter. We've got our platform. It's uh, been screwed together for two days. We took out the screws. We put on some little rubber feet on the bottom. So now we've got a nice platform to build everything out. Here we go. So we're gonna go 10 inches off the edge. I'm just center punching it right now. Well, the last video that I did on a small gasoline engine, the, the whole contraption kind of walked away on us with the vibration. So several viewers suggested getting some kind of rubber mount. So I ordered these off Amazon and hopefully they do the trick. These will go in like that. I wound up drilling these a little bit larger uh, just because I mounted the engine for the break-in cycle. Uh, did that while I was uh, waiting on a few more parts. I'll be using these nuts to hold the vibration damper down to this metal plate. Uh, that means I'm gonna have to recess the wood for the nut to fit so that the plate will sit flush on top. So in order to do that, uh, I'm gonna use these Fostner bits. And here's a, a 7 8 that'll be plenty of space. So here's my metal plate. I don't wanna bother painting it. So what I typically do with bare metal is I add a little bit of oil on it. This is, um, I don't know, that type of oil. I've had this can a long time. And I ordered some uh, flange nuts with the little nylon insert to hopefully keep it from vibrating off. That looks pretty straight in line with each other. Now we can lay it in with the nuts down in the recesses. You see we have a little bit of play. These are one and a quarter inch screws and the board should be one inch thick now that I doubled it up.
I mounted this uh, little meter up here. It's both an hour meter and a tachometer, so it'll measure RPMs, and it just wraps around the ignition coil. I did that off camera, but... Great. Well, it's time to work on this side of the engine. Now, something to note, this is a counterclockwise rotation engine. So watch the shaft as I pull, see that it's turning counterclockwise. But this alternator is a clockwise rotation. Now it'll actually produce power in both directions, but the trouble is that the fans are oriented a certain way. So the fans really want to be turning clockwise to have proper cooling across the stator. So we want to turn it clockwise, but this is a counterclockwise shaft. So we'll turn the alternator like that, and now both will turn the proper way. In order to get the correct distance on here of where to put the alternator, I think it will get the pulley on the shaft. So this is a three quarter inch shaft on the 212 and 224 motors. Uh, it has a keyway, so we have a, a long key that we can put in there. I checked online for hours and I was unable to find a three quarter inch with keyway uh, serpentine pulley. I could use a V-belt like this. This is a, a clutch with a V-belt and it fits the three quarter inch shaft and I could replace the pulley on the alternator. And that's uh, commonly done with a lot of uh, projects that you'll see out there. But I didn't want to do that. I really wanted the high surface area of the uh, serpentine belt. So instead, I found a serpentine pulley, and I'll leave a link to this in the description below. Now this pulley is made for a power steering pump. It is a six groove serpentine belt pulley. Now, this won't just slide on. Um, the spec sheet says that this shaft is uh, three quarters of an inch, which is 0 0.750 inches. The spec sheet for this pulley says 0 0.748. So we should have two thousandth of an interference fit between the two. There we go. It's not going to just press on just by hand. I purchased a little toolkit for uh, power steering pump pulleys. So I've never done one of these kits before. All right, well, don't know which one will fit. Turns out I don't have the right size adapter. The shaft on the engine takes a 5 16 by 24 inch thread. And unfortunately, that's just not in this power steering pump kit. So it must not be a common size for power steering pumps. Looks like I'll have to make something. This is a 3 8 inch bolt. Now it's a piece of all thread. <laughs> So I'm actually really excited about this little part. Uh, it's fun being able to make something. Uh, I don't have a lathe, but I think it'll work off that uh, drill press. So let's give it a shot. First time uh, doing this setup. So let's see here. This is the adapter. Uh, came in the, that kit. There we go. So that is supposed to take place of this type of thing, but now I have the right thread.
All right. <laughs> Finally, I had no idea that pulley was going to be such a pain to get on. But now I've got a part to do it again if I need to. So the back edge of this pulley needs to line up with this line that I drew on the ground. There we are. And now we'll tension it by pulling is move that over to the next hole. And then that should be better, be more tensioned. And I'm just making this up as I go. That might be too loose as well. Wow, this is taking a lot longer than I expected. If you're still sticking with me, thank you so much for doing so. We finally finished what I think is the mechanical side of everything. And now we're gonna switch gears to the electrical side. So we have all of the wires coming external, but now we're gonna focus on those external components, the full bridge rectifier, capacitor, etc. The electrical side of making all these connections. The stator has two windings. So we have the three phase from one winding and we have the three phase from the second winding. We also have this one going to the field coil, which will create that electromagnet. These need to connect up to something. So let's look at some of the components we've got acquired. First thing we're gonna need is this. It's a full bridge rectifier. And I got two of them because we have two stator windings. So the stator windings go to this full bridge rectifiers. From there, they're gonna have to jump to some bus bars to combine the DC side. We're gonna need a capacitor to smooth out that waveform, make sure that it's a nice steady DC. And then I even picked up this uh, DC to DC buck converter, which outputs five amps, 12 volts, uh, which that will hopefully power up our uh, field coil. This is a 40 to 160 volt DC input and 12 volt output. I hope we're gonna fall in that range so that all of this works. Now, I don't necessarily think it's gonna self excite. I kinda hope it will, you know, that would be awesome, but I might need to jumpstart it with a little 12 volt battery uh, and just hit it for a second, get everything up and running, and then the battery can go away. But we'll find out together. Now, the thing is that full bridge rectifiers get hot, so we need a heat sink. And that's why they're set up on the back side for a heat sink. So I happen to have this big heat sink here. So this little pink thing, this is kind of a thermal pad to help transfer heat. It's a big aluminum heat sink. So I'm thinking that the bus bars and the capacitor will probably be mounted over on this side. And over here, I'll probably toss in the uh, big heat sink. And I can put um, something like this together maybe, so that these things can transfer to the heat sink. That way this, uh, these wires that I already have on here, they can reach. So I'm gonna mark the holes. Again, on there nice and tight. This will be our DC to DC buck converter. I'm gonna to torque that down with a socket. So I'm just waiting till I have all of them on there. So as you can see, all the reds coming out from the alternator are going to one of the full bridge rectifiers 
The exact position on here doesn't matter so long as it's on the three-phase side. Over on this one, you can see the three-phase side has a little sine wave, little swirl mark on there. And the other side is marked positive. If I can get it to focus, there's a little positive symbol and a negative symbol. So that's the DC side. So next I need to make my wires from these bus bars and they're gonna travel around the side and then go up to this main positive and negative post on both of these uh, full bridge rectifiers. Uh, since I'm using 12 gauge for the three phase, I thought it would be suitable to use eight gauge. So this is eight gauge. And then I'm combining it with these ring terminals. And I love these ring terminals because they're marine, tin plated, and they are UL listed as well. So this one is an eight gauge by number 10 uh, hole. And then these ones are a bit bigger. They're eight gauge by five sixteenths. And all of that information gets printed on them. So anything that's 10 gauge and smaller, I can use a handheld ratcheting crimper like that. But anything that is eight gauge and bigger, so for my applications, I go from eight gauge up to four aught. I use this hydraulic crimper over here and they have all the different sizes. They have half sizes over here. Um, it's just a really nice set. It's, co it's complete and I don't have to look for anything. And then when I'm done, because the die has that eight gauge printed on it, it will show up on the crimp when I'm done the right size. I've got my two bus bars in place. The wires are nicely routed around and they're running to the full bridge rectifiers. I did turn this one. I thought it kind of worked a little bit better. And this is the supply wire uh, of hopefully 40 to 160 volts is what this can take. I hope I can hit 80 volts. Uh, and then the 12 volt out to the uh, coil. Well, since this is an alternator, it's producing alternating current. So the AC comes down into the full bridge rectifiers and comes out as DC, but I'm told there's a little bit of a ripple in it. So in order to clean up that ripple and really make it nice and steady of a DC direct current, I picked up this capacitor. As you can see, I definitely should not be hitting that 450 volts DC and it's a thousand microfarad. So we got to mount this about right there in between the two bus bars and then just have a little lead jumping down from both. Looks like we're gonna need a two inch hole. Take that off. I don't know if I've ever used the two inch. This is probably the first time. Well, we have our cool hole there. <laughs> and I'm just doing this in case I need to remove the capacitor. I don't want it to completely get destroyed. So I figure a little capped on tape might help an M5 by 0.8. I made up two little wire leads and they're coming off from the studs on the bus bars. Uh, these are 10 gauge. I really don't know if it matters what gauge because the capacitor is not uh, gonna be moving a ton of current. It's just uh, leveling out what's happening. So we'll get this on. I found a couple of fasteners. Uh, the capacitor did not come with fasteners. The capacitor has some flat spots down here on the studs. Next, we're gonna have our takeoff from the last two posts and it's gonna go out to our charge controller. But in this case, I have no idea what voltage we're going to have. I don't even know if this whole contraption is going to work. And I don't know what current we might be able to pull from it. So how am I supposed to size a circuit breaker? So I just went big with the circuit breaker. This is a 125 amp circuit breaker. 
uh, and I'll adjust it as I need. <laughs> I'll, I'll adjust, uh, once I know the current and voltage that I'm working with, I can purchase a better circuit breaker for this application. But in the meantime, this will just be an on off switch. So I'm gonna turn the circuit breaker like that. That way, when the wire comes off, I can secure the wire to in a couple of spots down to the board. Then this will just snap on. The funny thing is I'm putting in all this effort and I have no idea if the whole thing's gonna work in the end. Trim that out a little bit, hopefully it fits. Oh, and I'm hitting this little wire there. These bus bars are really cheap, really inexpensive. They're tin plated brass, uh, they're very thin. Uh, I know that the Amazon listings sometimes have these listed as 250 amps or 300 amps, uh, which is totally bogus. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't use these in over a 100 amp application. Uh, they, they're just gonna get hot. And I've seen it happen, I've tested them here on my workbench, they, they get hot. So there's much better bus bars for high amperage applications. Please don't use these cheap bus bars on your main inverter and battery connections. They come with these little plastic acorn nuts to go over the top. So I'll just put a little piece of Kapton tape across the top. There we go. Well, this is my Victron charge controller. It's MPPT or maximum power point tracking. It can take in up to 250 volts and it can output up to 100 amps to the battery. I added on this little DIN rail box on a previous build uh, with a treadmill generator. Uh, but in this case, I'm gonna remove this 16 amp circuit breaker, which I don't need anymore. And I'm gonna run the wires directly from here to the input terminals. We're gonna do a test run and just see what happens with like the belt and whether or not we get any kind of voltages off of this. So the circuit breaker's off. There's nothing connected to the end of the power wires that exit the contraption. <laughs> and so clearly that belt is too loose. We just finished the first test run. The good news is nothing blew up. The bad news is uh, there's definitely way too much slack in this belt. Uh, I'm gonna loosen that and then I can swing over to the next hole and put some more tension on this belt. There we go. I wanna be able to measure the RPM of the alternator. So this is the tachometer and we'll just take a piece of this reflective tape. So now I can measure that as it spins around. The belt has a lot more tension so I hope we solve that issue. And we've got our little piece of reflective tape on the alternator so that we can measure the alternator's RPM. The other thing that I noticed during the test run is that it would not self excite the field. So I will have to help it. So right now I'm hooking up the Victron charge controller to this 48 volt battery. And this battery is around 30% state of charge. This is the Victron app, and it's gonna let us see the incoming uh, volts and amps and the outgoing volts and amps and wattage. So that's just telling us what this charge controller is doing. So the charge controller is currently on, it has connection to the battery, but the circuit breaker on the generator is off. Again, this circuit breaker is currently off, so we're not outputting anything. Turn this on. Here we go. All right, at this point, we've been running for five or 10 minutes. Positive. We're just gonna touch this really 
Wow, it worked. And, and not just work. I mean, I actually think that worked pretty darn well. <laughs> I mean, there were so many unknowns going into this project. Uh, we're using a car alternator meant to recharge 12 volt batteries, and we got it to charge a 48 volt battery. Uh, we're powering the field uh, with a DC to DC buck converter. I mean, the concept all came together and didn't fail, didn't blow up. Uh, I think that was a pretty big success. <laughs> I'm excited about it. Uh, let, let's talk about some takeaways. What did we learn? Well, even when I set that charge controller up to 100 amps, we did not stall out the engine, which tells me that we were probably taking everything the alternator had to give us, which was about three kilowatts. Now, surprisingly, maybe not so surprising to some, but that's about what we could get in a car. That is a 215 amp rated alternator. Typically at 14 volts, that's about three kilowatts. So we're getting the same even though we're pulling a different voltage from it. Uh, the concept of spinning the alternator at a higher RPM to get a higher voltage, that concept worked. Uh, I wasn't sure if we were gonna get up to 80 volts or not, and we got up to 90 volts. Um, so how could we get more out of this? Well, uh, I'm not sure I want to. Maybe we're running uh, the engine at its peak of fuel economy. I don't know yet. Uh, but if we wanted to, we might be able to supply a higher voltage, like 15 or 18 volts, to the car alternator to excite the field. That would create a larger magnetic flux, and we might be able to pull more uh, current through the stator at that point. Uh, another takeaway would be, well, right now we have two full bridge rectifiers in parallel. Uh, potentially, I might be able to hook those in series 
and then direct drive the alternator uh, directly from the shaft. And that would save us a little bit off of the uh, belt, uh, whatever amount we might be able, we might be wasting from the belt. Uh, but we got three kilowatts out to the battery. And we have uh, about a 2% loss in the Victron charge controller. Uh, I don't know how much loss we have in a belt, but maybe 10%. And this being a 6.6 .6 horsepower engine, we were, that's I think 4.8 kilowatts. Uh, so, you know, I mean, that tells me that the alternator is doing at least 70% efficiency, but we didn't stall out the engine. So, you know, potentially the alternator might be doing slightly better than that. But I have a feeling that we were probably right on the limit of what we could do out of this setup. Now the alternator I bought off Craigslist for hundred bucks and this was 170, but we have a lot of other things into it. So I'd say we probably have $400 or so into the full build, not including the charge controller. So now that we actually ran it and we got some numbers, I know that we certainly don't need the expensive Victron charge controller. I could probably do this with a lot less expensive charge controller setup, uh, given that we only have the 90 volt open circuit. So you only need a 100 or 150 volt charge controller. Uh, but overall, the whole setup worked really well. Uh, let me know if you guys want me to run a fuel economy test on this setup and we'll see uh, how many kilowatt hours we get per gallon of gasoline we burn. And what did you think? I mean, did you think all this was gonna happen? Because I certainly had my doubts along the way. <laughs> uh, I wasn't sure if we'd get slippage on the uh, pulley uh, to the shaft of the engine, given that it's a press fit with no keyway. Uh, I wasn't sure if we'd get slip on the alternator, given that I'm using a six groove belt instead of an eight groove belt. Uh, but you know, we didn't, it, it, all, it all worked. <laughs> we still had more vibration than I would like. Uh, the platform still moved around when we put it under really heavy load. So if anybody has ideas on how to mount this in a better orientation to transfer less vibrations, I'd love to hear those suggestions. If you need to purchase any of these items, I have affiliate links in the description below. Those don't cost you any more, but they do help out the channel if you choose to use them. Well, thank you everybody so much for watching. If you enjoy the videos, please like, subscribe, comment, and share.